Quarkus Insights, Episode 7. GraalVM, Mandrel, Debug, JFK, and all of the good funds. Hello, everyone. So the episode we wanted to do last time is finally here with almost everybody cool. set up. But in this case, it's not Andrew's <laughs> having issue. It's Max, but, you know, nothing we... We had uh, nothing, uh, nothing like we had before. Yeah, exactly. So hello, everyone. Uh, remember, uh, if you want to comment, ask questions, uh, there is the comment on the YouTube, which shows live, and we will show some of the some of your you know comments and questions. Please have them. We are a very chatty bunch. So if you don't stop us for with your questions, we're just going to stay on for like ever on this one single subject. So be careful. <laughs> And Max is not showing up because uh, then he cannot hold his phone for one hour with his bare heart. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. So, so Max, yeah. do, you, uh, do you think we have specific like pre-subjects before we go on to GraalVM? Um, uh, I no, think I think we have, we have enough. I mean, we have enough for this hour, I think. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to just so people uh, know uh, is look out for news because there's a hackathon being announced later today. Um, that yeah. is about Caucus that we're doing. Yes. Um, but I don't know how much we can say or not because it's literally being announced as we talk. Um, well, but there'll we can be, say uh, what it's going to be. It's like uh, you will write an app. <laughs> Uh, or pu pu yeah, you got a week for something like that to do it, uh, and then there'll be categories oh. like best overall app, best uh, you have a, whatever app. You have a month. You have a month. It's a long. A month. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Well, that's yeah. plenty of time for, to do a Quarkus app. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Like, so, uh, uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna go on and there's like prices and stuff, but that's gonna. I think the start is sometime this week, um, yes. on Wednesday. So listen um, to Quarkus yeah. IO on Twitter, and that's probably where you'll see that announcement. You know, anytime. Yes. Yeah. So there is an echo. Okay. Uh, probably not much we can do, but then when Max will shut up and only Andrew will talk, hopefully the echo will just be gone. We hope. Don't worry. Um, okay. So uh, today we're going to look about. Uh, native image compilation for Quarkus applications. And some people say GraalVM is that, but GraalVM is many, many things. And what we're going to focus on is the GraalVM native image and some derivative interesting aspect of that. Uh, if we want to, now we can touch on other subjects, but the main usage for, for Quarkus is really the native image compilation. And yeah. I guess from there on, Andrew, do you wanna, you, you've been here a long time like here on this planet. So, you know, do you want to say a few things? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been around for a long, long time. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't quite agree with what you said. You know, you can use Quarkus on OpenJDK, and the native image uh, option is obviously very attractive, but it's attractive for a specific use case in particular. It's where you've got a container application, probably where you've got microservices where you want them all to be a small footprint and a quick startup, especially when you're spinning up images, uh, you know, say like something like function as a server, where you really, really want quick startup just to do a small job. So that that's, that's the sort of use case, it's the obvious case of a native image. But of course, it's a trade-off because um, the other side of that coin is when you're running with a native image, if you were running an app for a very long time, if you were running an app that had very large memory requirements and quite a high memory management overhead because it's working through memory a lot, then you've got benefits from running on OpenJDK. It can't really deliver those benefits if it's a short-lived app or if it's not using much memory because it doesn't make much difference. So definitely go for native image. But, you know, Quarkus also works in OpenJDK and it gives you great savings on OpenJDK against uh, uh, running with a conventional uh, enterprise libraries and application built on those. And but that, um, really, this is this is the container solution we're looking at. And that's why we're correct. interested and in it. Thanks for clearing that up. What I meant is within the GraalVM ecosystem, uh, our conversation today is going to be around native image, but of course, oh, yeah. Quarkus itself can run on uh, 
open jdk and even you know other jdks uh you know quite perfectly and it's a very suitable solution uh for people that have uh whose you know very high memory density is not the main you know absolute main you know imperative uh, just like you said so i won't i won't re redo it mm -hmm. So yeah, and uh, yep, uh, were you so the, the the other point I guess is that, that the native image is only one part of what GraalVM is. GraalVM actually is mostly oriented around the idea of polyglot programming, and there's a an interpreter framework called Truffle which integrates with the Graal compiler to give you uh, very heavily optimized execution for uh, the, uh, the for the interpreted languages at the point where it matters. So it does a bit similar sort of thing to what Hot does, Hotspot does in the JVM, but for all these other interpreted languages, and we're not really interested in that for Quarkus because we're really looking at using Quarkus for Java enterprise applications rather than for these polyglot languages. So that's where really we, we're focusing on the native image part of GraalVM. That's really what we're interested in, in Quarkus users using. Obviously, that's possible for, for people to use the full GraalVM download and all that capability, but we're, we're really focusing on just that subset. So back to you. In a recent galaxy or recent history, you were doing middleware work, uh, and then you shifted to, I guess, lower levels if we stack stuff, right? So do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I've, I've actually, um, I started my career fairly early on uh, working on the Xerox list machines and I worked for the company that distributed them. So the first operating system I ever learned was a Lisp operating system, complete thing written in Lisp. So virtual machines and... <laughs> Max I, was gonna, just I was just going to say... I was just like, you've been here for a long time then. <laughs> well, I was very lucky when the list machines were around in the in the mid 80s. It was 85. I got my hands on one. I had yeah. to have done a little bit of object oriented programming back in 85 um, in Lisp. Uh, so it was quite quite a sort of oddball thing to be doing. But I ended up just by chance falling on my feet and getting a chance to work for a company that wanted people to build applications on the list machine. So we had stuff that basically was 20 years ahead of its time. It took that long for the, the Linux world to catch up, you know, and um, and it was it, it, we had I had access to the whole virtual machine, the whole uh, Lisp runtime. It's very like a JDK runtime plus JVM, but all built in one language. And of course, when you look at Graal, where the Graal virtual machine is written in Java and sits underneath the JDK runtime written in Java, it's very like the sort of setup you had on the Lisp machine. It's a complete, uh, it's, it's turtles all the way down, you know. And the same, the same before I actually worked at Red Hat, I'd worked on the Jikes RVM, which was actually built by IBM Smalltalk Group, and it was a Java in Java runtime again. Um, so I, I, I've got a long background in virtual machines and JIT compilation, compiling to native, uh, high level languages to native, native. I, to native. Yeah. I, I didn't know you were, so you said Jax, right? The, the yeah, that's game. right, yeah. I still remember that time when it came out. That was like a whole revelation of, oh, I can build my stuff in like seconds or minutes rather than you know, yeah, well, there's, the, there's the Jake's Java compiler, but there was also an underlying virtual machine and runtime which went with it, which was done as a research exercise. It was called Jake's RVM for research virtual machine. And so okay. I, I spent five years in Manchester working on that, putting in compiler extensions, and I actually ported it to run on a, a chip, um, a, a, a multi core chip simulator so that we could actually do experiments putting extra capabilities into the hardware. And we had a tool chain from Java all the way down through the compiler to the hardware. So we could make uh, Java extensions that use hardware extensions and play around with scheduling and caches and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a really interesting th that you could do that with Jikes RVM. And it was very much because it was built as Java in Java. It was all the same stuff right the way down. And it just got compiled down to a, a, a machine code, but it was a dynamic runtime, not like the the the, the Graal uh, um, substrate virtual machine, the native image of that. That's a fixed closed world. Jikes yeah. was an open world Java where you would compile it to a, a, a beginning image, but then you could also load classes dynamically at runtime. Um, yeah, we've, so got a, it, we've got a question from Donato, which says, uh, "Will Quarkus able to integrate other languages through Graal VM?" And the answer is yes, right now. Some people already use uh, the Gradium truffle aspect, uh, mix that with the Quarkus app. Uh, I think some people are using R, for example. Uh, yeah. So yes, it, it is not, uh, let's say, the Red Hat focus, but then, you know, Quarkus is bigger than Red Hat. So, you know, that's uh, 
general community, yeah. you know, community interest. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, oh, oh go, go ahead, Andrew. Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about about here because we're, we're, we're quite comfortable with this, the substrate, the virtual machine that replaces the JVM. We've got quite a lot of familiarity with the ground compiler, but there's no one in Red Hat at the moment who's very expert in Truffle and all the language implementations of Truffle. So while we're happy to support Quarkus on the native image generator and, and native deployments, um, if someone's using Truffle, it's going to be harder for us to actually support that. Um, yeah. It'll when take a mean, while before we ramp up. When you, you know? mean support, you mean the Red Hat build of Quarkus, right? There's the Quarkus community doing things, and then Red Hat build of Quarkus, where Red Hat engineers are like fully support the stack. You can go and go bananas yeah. with it. We'll, we'll back you exactly. up. Exactly. And I mean, it's great yeah. that people are playing with this stuff and, and, and we will give community support for whatever we can for people playing, whether it's um, on the releases we provide or the releases that Oracle provide. And we're keen for people to play with this stuff and to, to, to help with what we know and to learn from what they're doing. We, we get an enormous amount of benefit from interacting with the community, but we are definitely not experts in, in, in Truffle at the moment. That's an area that we haven't really moved into yet because our Java team has been learning about the the, the the JIT compiler initially, and then the substrate, the lightweight virtual machine that replaces the JVM for native images. And we've got a good grasp of that now. But there's a, a lot of stuff out there in the Graal VM uh, release, and, and we obviously don't understand all of it yet in, yeah. in that detail. Yeah. OK, so um, Graal VM. Like, so you mentioned closed world, but very quickly. So maybe for people a bit less familiar. So what does Graal VM native image bring to the table? And why is it so interesting? Okay, so what, what, this is a bit like what I don't. If anybody's ever used GCJ, it was a similar sort of model in the original GCJ. When when you um, make an, an, a, a native binary out of um, a Java application with 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 the Graal native image component, you start from a main in, a main method of a class that you provide as the entry class, and you provide all the application classes that would normally be loaded into the JVM when you run that application. And what the um, what the native image generator does is it starts in that class, it finds all the classes that are referenced in the application suite, it, it, it looks at them, analyzes the bytecode recursively, and finds the whole complete closed world of all the classes that are referenced from that starting class. And if there's, if there's a situation where it can't work out what class might be loaded, say for example, you had a program that read a name from the, the TTY and then did a load class with that name, you couldn't possibly know, and then you called it via an interface, say. You couldn't possibly know uh, what, what, or you call it by reflection. You wouldn't know what it was going to actually be at runtime. You couldn't build a native image that would implement that program. It's not possible to have a native image where the code isn't compiled in in advance. If it's possible for you to identify every single class that could ever be used by the program, then the native image generator takes all the methods that are referenced from the main method and actually works out in advance what code would be needed to implement the application and builds a complete shrink racked application. So the application won't load any classes at runtime. It won't compile anything at runtime um, for a Java application that's a native image. Um, and and you've, you've, got, you've got to be able to be sure that you know the complete closure of the class base and the method base. And one of the benefits of doing that is that you can do some optimizations that aren't available in OpenJDK in a dynamic runtime or any other dynamic Java. Because you know exactly which cl which classes are around, which methods can be called, you know whenever a method call happens, even if it's a virtual call, what the possible target methods would be. You know exactly which classes could be instantiated. There might only be one implementation of a method. So you can make a direct method call rather than a virtual call. Uh, the switch statements and so on all have determinate bounds. You know, there's there's a lot of optimizations the compiler can do because it knows exactly what it's dealing with in the same way as a C compiler does. Of course, the other side of the coin is you can't recompile code on the basis of what happens at runtime. So OpenJDK has alternative op opportunities for optimization, but they take a while to deliver. Um, so there is actually a trade-off here. It's not like a straight win for Graal, but there are some really interesting things that you can do to get um, a very fast application. And of course, you can also throw away a whole load of the information you need in a dynamic runtime. If you might load a class and end up having some extra code loaded into the runtime, well, then you may have to go and revise the code you've already compiled and recompile it to deal with a case you hadn't allowed for. 
So you need to keep track of all the classes that are around. And then when a new class gets loaded, actually rebuild some of the runtime. That doesn't happen in Graal because classes don't get loaded. So you can have a much smaller amount of data in the runtime and, and therefore get a, a smaller footprint for the image. The objects aren't necessarily smaller. I and mean, sometimes you might be able to throw away a field that was declared and wasn't used. And OpenJDK wouldn't know whether a field was going to be used or not because something loaded later might want it. So there's a possibility occasionally for making objects yeah. slightly smaller. Yeah, and that's, that's but, an but really important it's, it's, aspect because some people sort of magically believe that uh, Graal, uh, sorry, native image apps are magically using less memory, but definitely the data structure is more or less, there is no reason why it would be smaller or bigger than the Java equivalent, right? Except the those yeah. field optimizations. Yeah, occasionally there might be a field that was put in there and actually wasn't used by the application. It might have been used if you'd driven it differently, maybe. So it can happen for good reasons. It only usually happens because somebody's thrown in a field that was pointless anyway. So there's not really room to just to minimize your heap usage, but there is room to minimize the actual amount of data the virtual machine needs to keep hold of. And in fact, a lot of it also can be made constant. Of course, Quarkus does this for the dynamic runtime as well. It's capable of ironing out a whole lot of data that's normally created during bootstrapping and gets thrown away. It can just avoid and just put constant values in as well. So it's possible to do some, some of the tricks with the dynamic runtime, but the, the real trick you get is the ability not to have to have as much management information because the virtual machine is a lot simpler. It doesn't need it all. So that's a real benefit for light footprint and therefore fast startup as well. So just be, uh, to just, uh, go a bit, uh, uh, jump, let's call jump, not jump ship, but jump to another one because one of the things that people are for Graal is we have all this, you know, speed and efficiency and advantages and, and whatnot. But one of the big things that, that people always were concerned about when we used Quarkus and Graal VM is stuff like, hey, do you lose the ability to monitor and debug and that kind of thing? Um, and I know that you, you've done a lot of work here, so maybe you want to highlight some of that stuff. Yeah. I know that's something you think we yeah. Yeah, the, the, I mean, that's, that's absolutely critical for usability. There are two really critical things you need, um, monitoring and the ability to debug if something goes wrong. Obviously, if you're developing an application, you can debug it in a fairly rich environment on OpenJDK. There's lots of great debug tools. But when you then take your application and you build a, a standalone native image out of it, it's actually compiled to very heavily optimized machine code. And it's not got any of the capabilities that allows you to see what's going on inside the running image. Um, so the two things that you you don't have, you don't have the ability to run up a debugger and connect to the program and see what it's doing. Um, and you don't have the ability to switch on, say, Java Flight Recorder or some other tracing mechanism and then see what the program is actually doing by getting uh, dumps of information about the progress of the program from a tool like, like Flight Recorder. Um, and that you can, you know, you can, you can do really powerful debugging with that and mission control for the dynamic runtime. So those are the two gaps we saw as being critical for usability of Graal, Graal VM native with Quarkus. And we've actually decided to do work ourselves to rectify that. There was a, a debug package, a, a, a capability in the enterprise edition of Graal VM. And I've actually built a, a capability to do debugging of the program uh, from um, a GDB on Linux. And we've got somebody working on Windows debugging who's almost got a, he's got a, a version that's just as the basic functionality. So that's still a work in progress, but we've got quite good quality debugging on, on Linux. And our Java team is also working on putting JFR event generation into native images. So you'll get garbage collector events. You can get application events when things significant happen in the application. You can get events from the JDK runtime when threads are created and so on. So we should, we're working towards having JFR notifications come out and then you can view what the, the program is doing with mission control with exactly the same sort of capability as you'd have when you're using mission control with a dynamic JVM. Of course, you won't see compile events because compilation isn't going on, but you'll see all the other events in the runtime or that the application generates. Let me uh, inject a question that somebody might have, uh, uh, which is, hey, so, so Oracle has this, you know, uh, open source version of it, which for which they are hoping to build a community. And then there is this enterprise edition version where you said the, the debug symbols and other things are. 
uh, and you build uh, uh, essentially an open source version of the, the debuggability of native image, like, do they hate you? <laughs> and maybe Max, you can you know come also and, and join uh, join that conversation. Uh, well, we, we I've actually been working on Graal for over three years now. I started doing work to help get the compiler generate better machine code for ARM64, which is mostly what I do on OpenJDK. Um, and um, it, it, the, 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 te the team we were actually talked to were very keen to have our help and very helpful. Um, now, when it came about a year ago to us talking to Oracle and saying, well, we see this as a critical bit of functionality that we really need to have have uh, debugging using a debugger and and flight recorder we really would like to put them in they were a sort of a bit sort of wary at first but we we convinced them that we were doing this because we want to support the, the um the capability we want to work with them we want it to work to the best possible we want to make life easy for their customers and actually they from when they realized that we were working with them rather than against them we weren't trying to build a competitor we we're trying to improve and put things upstream into their product they were very yeah, for very the helpful. long term which was a critical aspect for them yeah, yeah, and and this this is interesting because this is the story we had when we started contributing to Open Shady K, very 10, 15 years ago when Andrew Haley started our Java team. 15 years ago, it was very difficult for us to get things into Open Shady K because they were used to working on their own. They didn't really think anybody had much to contribute to them. You know, I mean, we're the experts. Well, why do we need these guys? And actually, over particularly when I joined the team 10 years ago, we started to really ramp up and we put the ARM port in, we put the Shenandoah garbage collector in, and they, they we are really on good terms with the Open JDK team because they realize it's a win-win for all of us. We're taking some of the load, we're building a better product, they've got our ideas, our, our, our skilled people. Now, we're seeing the same thing happening with Graal. The Graal team, um, all the engineers and the managers are now actually cooperating with us to let us work with them to help add new capabilities. And not just Red Hat, there are other other vendors involved as well. I mean, um, the, uh, the, 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 the yeah, yeah. And um, also the, the, the people who do the, um, uh, the, the Java FX work, Gluon, uh, for example, have done a lot of interesting work. Twitter and Pivotal and others too. Yeah, yeah. Twitter. Twitter yeah. has had um, uh, well, they, they had a compiler guy who'd worked on the the Graaljit compiler who who went to yeah. work for Twitter. So they've contributed a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's there's, there's quite a big community now, and it, and it's it's actually working really really well. And I think the Oracle engineers are, are now in a situation like with the Open JDK engineers, they understand how to work with people and change their processes a bit to help us. So it's really going very very well, and I'm I'm really pleased yeah. with that. Yeah, and hey, it's, been, got, it's been a. Sorry, I'm just uh, like priority on the on the live action. <laughs> no, there, <laughs> there, there was some side conversation into like what language, if you were going for Polyglot, what language would we want uh, for support? And um, uh, sorry, so Donato was saying, hey, I want to integrate with C and C libraries, legacy libraries. But I think that's a sort of a different uh, model here you don't necessarily need a uh, truffle to integrate with a c core yeah it's possible for you to link c libraries in using the linkage model that graal itself uses because graal was originally having everything written in java and one of the things that changed about 18 months ago is they started using some of the open jdk libraries not the vm library but the auxiliary libraries for io and so on um and, and that means they have a way of linking in um, code generated from, C, from a, a C compiler, from C source code, into Java uh, seamlessly so you can call direct into it. And it's interesting because that's actually a capability that's also going into OpenJDK. There's, there's an extension, um, the Panama project is, is doing exactly the same thing to, to get direct linking of C routines and C data structures into, into, into Java so you can peek and poke values straight in. That's essentially already there in Graal. So if you wanted to integrate with the C library, you could do it using the C foreign language uh, linking model they have. But also you can run C programs self-contained via a C language interpreter using Truffle and Truffle provides it ways to share data with things written in other languages. But you'll sit that's sitting above the the actual uh, compiled program level okay. uh, uh, via the interpreter. So it's not quite as, as effective as using the library plugin model in terms of efficiency. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm smiling because <laughs> Max and I had the same thought It's like, 
Andrew has very, very long sentences. You have, you do have no idea when to cut him to go to the next subject. <laughs> yeah, Prolix, that is my middle name. Yeah. yeah. So we, we'll probably block you at some point, but don't take it personally. Uh, you know, just want to move to some other stuff. No problem. Mark was saying, in popular opinion use case, uh, Quarkus for the backend uh, as, you know, Java, right? And then server-side rendered React.js for the front-end. So that's Java plus JavaScript. So that would be a use case, yeah. but I would argue you might also want to have it in two different uh, uh, microservices, if we want to call it that way. So you got your React.js, you know, server-side rendered, you know, uh, stuff, and that can use your plain, uh, say, V8, or you go for GraalVM uh, if you want that. that. Yeah. But then, then Quarkus remains the, the classical Quarkus. So that would be yes. an option for that. Yeah. Maybe should we move the to the demo or something? What do you guys think? Because it's uh, almost half yeah, an hour. Look, Demo. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sh show the demo. Yes. Okay, um, I'm going to. Um, I'll switch to uh, share screen here. Um, yep. What I'm going to do is actually uh, show you a little program. It's a Hello World program. Hello World is really boring, so there's no point debugging it because it's one line. So I, I've made a. I've made a slight variation on. Um, on that, um, which is a slightly more complicated version of Hello World. So we have a class called hello still, but if we get down to the bottom here, we'll see that its main you're, method is you're using... Not sharing, you're not sharing the screen yet. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Here's here's this um, this class I've, I've got, um, a class called hello. It's in a file, hello Java. And it's um, it's using an auxiliary class called greeter, which is a class so that knows how to... Hold on, are you using Emacs greeting. to write yeah. Java code? Yes. Yeah. Wow, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do use an ID now and again, but mostly I do it in Emacs. So <laughs> don't forget, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a JVM engineer, so we mostly write C++ code anyway. So, you know, yeah. but yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I'm using GDB, because GDB, it goes with Emacs beautifully. You'll see that later when I actually run it. Yeah. So here we've got a, a main routine for this class, hello, and it's using this greeter class. It's going to call a method of the greeter to print a greeting message. Uh, it uses a builder method and it passes in the command line arguments. So we'll get different greeters back depending on what's on the command line. And after it's printed the greeting message to say hello world, it'll call system exit. So there's the basic um, uh, bit of code that it runs. This class greeter is an abstract class and it has the method greet that prints the greeting. And here's the builder method. If there's nothing on the command line, no arguments, it's going to return a default greeter. Obviously, that's going to print hello world. If there's one argument, the, the argument's um, length is one, it's going to pass that in and create a named greeter. And that will say hello with a particular name. And if there's more than two, you get a random exception. And then the two classes that implement that, obviously the default greeter, it just calls system.out.println. And the name greeter, its constructor, stashes that argument from the command line into a, a private field called name. And it pastes together a string with hello and the name when you run it and uses print ln just to print that out. So we're going to get a customized uh, hello message if we pass in an argument. OK, so I'll just show you that. I've already pre-compiled that and the class is just in the local directory. So if we run Java hello, it says so hello you say, world. You say you pre-compiled it, but just for info, uh, or how long I've did just it took, you know? What, oh, this is no. This is just Java C compiled. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I'll, well, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether to run the actual the native image to generate a native image will take about ninety seconds. But I'll start that off and explain what's going on. Okay. Fair so, um, so there's the program compiled. Um, wh what I need to do, I, I'm running this. I'm actually uh, here's my command line. I'm going to show you. I'm running this inside, not one of the downloads, because we've got a few little bugs in the initial version, the latest version of Graal, which don't quite work right. So I'm using actually a source build that has the latest patches. So I'm running the native image command, um, which is um, normally you would just have your Graal download and you'd run native image and give it the the entry class hello. Uh, I'm actually running MX native image because I'm using the build tool in my local Graal build to run native image. Um, it's not being packaged as a downloadable release. So I'm just going to use the build tool to drive it. And, and, and just and get for binary. people, that's why when you're, you're not an open JDK or Graal engineers, you want to use Quarkus to compile your application because instead yeah. of having to figure that out, <laughs> we just say uh, MVN packet, uh, sorry, uh, what is it? Install minus uh, what? Minus D native, and then up, off you go. 
So. Yeah, this, this this is all just going to work for you automatically with Quarkus. Um, I'm just driving it by hand, and I'm I, this is this is very hot off the press. It's only just released, so I'm having to allow the fact that a few things don't work. But the basic command that, that you'd use normally would be native image hello. I'm using MX native image hello, and then I've got a few extra arguments in. So the first argument, if I ran that as it was, we'd get a very heavily optimized binary. There'd be no information in the binary that would allow a debugger to know where the code came from, which source files, even what the backtraces look like. It wouldn't know where the method boundaries are. It would be an absolute mess and you couldn't debug it. So if I put this extra flag in, minus h generate debug info equals one, if I set that setting to one, it's gonna put debugger information into the native binary when it's generated. So it'll find all the classes below hello, compile them all, but as well as putting the compile code and all the data into the program, it'll also add what's called dwarf debug info. And for a Windows deployment, it'll put Microsoft uh, format uh, debug information into the into the program as well. So you'll be able then to run it with a debugger and the debugger will know what the program is doing. So that's the other flag you'd have to provide. Quarkus has a switch which just switches that on automatically. By the now, way, one the, of, the one is because you're in tend to have different uh, debug info modes or we'll have different levels of debug yeah okay. at the moment it's either zero or one it may well be zero one or two at some point so that that's that's still at the moment it's just zero or one i hope you um, put 11 at some point <laughs> yeah we i think we've got to go up to 11 definitely <laughs> Um, now when when it's th what, what this is going to do is going to take all the classes that are in my build build system here it's going to take the application classes which are in the local directory it's going to take all the JDK runtime classes that are linked in, you know, system, um, all the garbage collector classes and all the other things that are needed. They're all going to get built into the image. It's actually going to take all the substrate virtual machine classes that replace JVM functionality because you don't need the JVM. It's got a built in little lightweight VM. That's all going to go into the actual generated binary plus information saying where it comes from. But that's not enough to debug because you also want to know which source files are actually used. They're all here. Um, I've got the source file for hello in my local directory. If I had a jar, I could have a sources jar for it if, if I'm using Maven. So the, the generator knows where the sources are in this build time environment. It knows where the Java sources are. They're in the source.zip for the current download of, of, of Graal or, or the, the, jar, the JVM I'm using. So it knows where all the Graal sources are. They're in source zip files here as well. But when we deploy on our target machine, we can't just throw, we don't want to have to take all those jar files, all the zip files and stuff and throw them over onto that target machine. So what happens is the native image generator finds every file that you would ever need to debug this program and it stashes it away in a local directory here. It's going to create a directory called sources. And so it'll stash hello.java away. It'll stash javalangmath.java away because we're going to end up using a math routine somewhere in the virtual machine. It'll stash away javalangsystem.java and so on in the local directory. And that means you can then put all those files onto your deployed machine when you want to debug. And the debug will have information in the binary that says, well, if you tell me where those files are, I'll find the files I need as I'm debugging and I'll show you the source lines. Hey, so can I'll, I interrupt I'll, you for just a minute. So I'll, there's I'll set it going and yeah, we'll talk yeah, while it's running because right. it takes about 90 seconds to build the image. So there's a couple of questions. So Clement was asking, do you need the debug info source, you know, setting uh, inside Quarkus? Uh, so what's going to happen is Quarkus will have a, I forgot what it is, but let's say Quarkus debug enables equals true or maybe one. No, uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. And that will then do the right minus H for you. So you don't yeah, have to think um, about that. Well, normally, normally you won't. If you're using Maven, you'll have a sources jar sitting next to your, your application jar. So it'll find the sources. Mm -hmm. it, it, it'll know where the Graal sources are for the substrate VM. It knows where the Java sources are. So it finds them almost in, in most cases. Okay. If you've got a Maven project where the sources are not in the standard location, you might have to specify this debug info source search path and say, look for sources over there. Now, in the in, in, at the moment, in the Graal builds and in the even in the source build, a couple of the Graal source zips are missing. So I've added them. Otherwise, we wouldn't find some of the source files. When we shrink wrapped a, a release that works with Quarkus and got it actually released, all the sources you'll need will be there for the Graal code. All the sources for the JDK will be there. If your application's got a source jar next to the class jar in the class path, it'll find all the sources. So this is just completely automatic. By the time you've run the native image program, all of your um, source files are already 
um, sitting in the local source directory and you've got everything you'll need to debug and it just happens by magic. Okay, um, I got another question which I'll uh, rephrase before going to the core of the question. But first of all, we've got our first negative reaction, Max, <laughs> ever. So that's interesting. Um, uh, still lots of positive vibes, so that's good. Uh, so the question is why the native image compilation is so slow? Do you have plan to speed it up? Uh, and uh, on top of that question, I'll add, when you do debug symbols, uh, do you slow even more the compilation? Um, okay, so I well, can address both. there's two reasons. Um, it's yeah. slow because it's doing an enormous analysis of all the byte code in the code base and loading all the stuff recursively and analyzing all the calls to see which things have really been called and which things don't actually get called. So there's a very complicated analysis process going on. It's particularly slow because I'm running this on an ARM machine because you can run debug. Uh, we can run debug on ARM. We can deploy applications for ARM as well as for x86. Uh, the reason I, 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 I'm doing it on the ARM machine is because if I ran it on the machine I'm talking on now, everything would grind to a halt and I, my Skype <laughs> session would probably yes. die because it would max out all the processes. Um, it seems to be taking an inordinately long time, though, much more than it should do. It should be about a minute and a half. So I'm wondering whether it's got wedged. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that those those are two reasons. Also, um, uh, when it when it runs, it, it, adding the extra information to computing what all the debug information is and adding it to the binary adds about ten seconds to a ninety second run for this program. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it also the image is about six and a half megabytes. If you build a plain image, if you build an image with debug info in, it's about uh, it's about ten megabytes. So the debug info adds a reason amount of size to the image, but of course that's not loaded into the running program that's sitting there until you debug and then it's used it's just data there's i think one, i'm gonna have to uh, i think uh Galda is exploring it there's one aspect where we figured maybe we could move the debug info into a side file if people are really you know caring about the size of the image itself but uh, that's a further potential optimization uh, yeah, that, that's the thing that we will be doing because we do this with OpenJDK. You can have a, a separate .dbz file which has all the debug info stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just rerunning this again because it obviously got wedged. Okay. Um, you can have a, 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 a separate DBZ file which has the debug info in it. At the moment, we're building it actually in the image itself, but we, we should be able to do that very straightforwardly. Yes. We just strip the symbols and then put them into a yes. separate file. And um, on the core of so, the speed itself, uh, the GradVM team is aware of it, so we gave them the feedback really early on. I know they're starting to have time to work on that, so they added an option to sort of fall back a bit faster than they used to on some of the uh, uh, analysis. So it will be less optimized, but then will compile faster and, and consume less memory. Uh, I don't know if it's just uh, enabled, not enabled by default yet or enabled by default, but this is stuff they are figuring out, I think. Yes, I mean, yeah, it's, one of the things, yeah. it's possible, it's possible to be slightly less exact about what gets called so that you might compile in some method, some code for methods that if you've done a bit more analysis, wouldn't actually get called. So you get a slightly right. bigger image. But because you're doing less work to analyze what's precisely being called where, you can spend less time doing the analysis. So there's a trade-off as to how how much work you do versus how much you can compact the image. Um, and that's really the, the trade-off that they, they want to make. This is um, taking yeah, a stupidly long time, I'm afraid. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to add, this one of the things I learned the last year uh, being involved with this stuff is that the whole compiler set up that Graal is doing, and I think it's the same thing on the K, is just based on assumptions, right? They, they optimize on the case they know, and in, early on there was about having a native image inside the Oracle database, so it's a much smaller apps, and now it's more production apps, and it's just algorithm to do it, it's just different. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, I actually heard a different story feedback. on the origin. Uh, so maybe there is the official truth and then the unofficial <laughs> truth, but the other one was... Um, one of the requests they had was to, um, what was it? Yes, to have the, so initially when you were using GraalVM in a normal Java mod, JDK mod, they were literally embedding their compiler as a Java app as part of your heap. And some people didn't really like that. So they, they worked on the native image to move the compiler aspect all of the Java heap size. Uh, that was one of their way to make that happen. So that's the official truth I heard. 
Yeah, and they and they made it a very very lightweight virtual machine, and um, they had everything implemented in Java, and they only implemented the things they needed. But once they started to try and support more and more complicated Java applications, they needed to actually have more of the JDK runtime capability and more of the VM capability coded using SVM. Um, substituted. So the project also grew in scope. It was originally just for very small programs running inside the Oracle database. And then it started really become a, a solution for running general purpose Java programs. And that's one of the reasons why they switched to reusing the OpenJDK libraries, because they'd recoded the JVM functionality they needed in Java. But uh, that was fine for a one-off for JDK 8 for the subset they started with. By the time they wanted all of that, that Java library capability, it was much better to reuse the existing work of the OpenJDK team. So they're now using the OpenJDK native libraries for the native implement the implementation of native methods for JDK runtime classes. Yeah. There's a quick question, actually, which is somewhat related. Like, any plan for supporting JDK 14 in GraalVM? So I think from Red Hat itself, no, we tend to stick to the LTS, um, I think. So that's another aspect of uh, our support that we probably have to go to is like, which JDK do we use underneath and so on. But I think the GraalVM team, I'm not sure if they support any version of Java in the future or just the LTS as well. So I'm not quite sure what they... Um, you can actually use if you if you um, have the Graal VM download and you try to run it with the latest JDK, which I think is now JDK 15. They try to make that keep that working all the time. I think it may also know about JDK 14, recognize that, and be able to work with JDK 14. Um, so it is possible to use a later JDK release. But um, okay. it's 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 a it's a continuing update process because that's really using their their head release um, and it's not it's it, you know it'll it'll move on from one JVM to another so um, there's no guarantee of reliability for that but they need that for development themselves because obviously at some point they'll need to work with JDK 17 so they're keeping up to date with the latest releases. Yeah. So, do you have a already so compiled like, well, version so we can move to the next step? No, of the I haven't. <laughs> no, because when I built it before, it's built every single time. But this is the curse of the demo. <laughs> and I have no okay, idea so why what, it's not working. <laughs> anyway, there is. So, that for those who. who so, we can, uh, yeah. Uh, what uh, Andrew's got a demo was that you can use JDDB to debug through your native and Java parts. And he actually made a nice video last week, a week or two, where he actually showed it. So if you go to Quarks.io, there's a video where it goes through and actually works. Yeah, um, and it worked there because it wasn't a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> it worked three times today when I tried it up before as well. Same. It wasn't a live demo. My video setup worked perfectly the last two days, except <laughs> until I had to go on this call. So uh, we had, <laughs> I'm really sorry so just, about that. <laughs> so anyway, so... Uh, so just want to, to understand what we are working on in Red Hat, right, on, on, on Crawl Game. So one is the debug functionality, which you were nicely demoing uh, last week, and it apparently still works. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about the, the flight recorder? Do we have a like a timeline for that, or is it just some time? We're working on a proof of concept. We have um, we've got something where we can basically execute flight recorder operation event generation operations, get them into a memory buffer, and then when we're trying we're, we're wanting to transfer them to a disk file, we've got them lined up, ready to go in a disk file, but we haven't got the code to actually write the things into the, the disk file okay. yet. So we, that in, that's actually a lot more work than it sounds because in order to get the events generated, there's a whole lot of stuff that has to go inside the VM to make it possible to produce events. So Gald is saying, actually, we just got our first event written to a, to a file today. So, so we, awesome. we can write a single <laughs> JFR event at least. Um, it's, awesome. it's, a, it's, it's actually a much more complicated job than the debug info because JFR is quite tightly integrated into the JVM as well as the JDK runtime. And it does things like redefine classes, play around with adding extra fields to every class so it can have a, a class ID, a me method ID, and so on. So um, gotcha. it, it, there's a lot of thread IDs. There's a lot of stuff that happens. And we've been working through that. Well, I say we. It's actually one of our really great young engineers who's been doing that. He's, he's done a brilliant job, plus a few other people um, who've been working with him. It's, 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 um, it's, it's really impressive we've got as 
far as we have. We think we'll have a proof of concept where it does all that they'll do basic event generation in maybe a month or so. Yeah. Getting into product is going to be a lot more work, obviously. Sure. Hey, there is an interesting uh, question, oh. which is, um, is there a way to do incremental compilation to speed things up? Which is the like, hey, why don't you guys so stupid? You didn't think about that. <laughs> But it's interesting um, to understand why it's difficult or even like it's like a research level at this stage, uh, incremental compilation yeah, the, of flows world. Yeah, the reason why it's it's really hard to do that is that you have to basically load the whole thing in one go and cross reference everything as you're loading. So when you when you find that one class refers to another class, you load that class and then you find that it refers to further classes and you may already have some information about those classes you may not. You may also find that it calls methods that you haven't yet marked as being invoked. So you have to then identify that it invokes those methods. You may also find that you've loaded a subclass of an existing class. And that means where you thought there was only maybe one method that can be invoked, there's now another alternative implementation or three alternative implementations. So you're slowly building up a, a, a big picture of the whole code base. And it's very cross-reference and very recursive. And that's really why it takes such a long time. So um, if, if, it's if not really to possible to do it incrementally. <laughs> it might be possible for you to save some of the information for next time, but you'll probably find that reloading the data and building up your in-memory model is probably slower than doing it all from scratch. This is this is something that we've tried as an optimization open JDK to pre-prepare code for running when we start up. And it, it's just very difficult to do it more efficiently than just doing the full analysis of the whole thing in one great big uh, recursive mess. You know. So, yeah, so what I'm going to get to was the mandrel part, because that's in the title of this, <laughs> this talk. Because uh, yeah. uh, this is the thing I uh, will get to, so people understand why we, we did this. So mandrel was announced, I think, last week, or week before. Um, and, GitHub slash uh, slash uh, Yeah. So this is a product inside the Gravium uh, product. We, again, we worked very well with the, the Gravium team. Uh, and the need for us was that, as you hear here, that we are we have a team on our side of Red Hat, and there's a Gravium team, and we all work very well together. But sometimes our release schedule or timing and stuff doesn't work uh, perfectly, or there's some stuff that doesn't, you know, uh, the stuff we want to try out that the other team might not have on a priority, or vice versa. So uh, we actually had this. We wanted to have this way of not holding back. Gra uh, sorry. Uh, growl, or and at the same time not hold back what we could do in, in Quarkus land. And that's kind of where Mandel is, is that it's an attempt to have a mechanism where we can release uh, uh, improvements to native image, whether that is, for example, the debug stuff. We, originally, we planned to have debug symbols in, in, in what now called Mandel, but Growlvim actually included it. But once we get to JFR, for example, it might be that we can add support for that in Mandel earlier than we can in, in Growlvim. But the default work we are doing is still upstream in, in Graal. It's just with Mandrel, we have a way to release it uh, on top of, uh, let's call it plane of Nidic A, that is from uh, Andrew's team. Uh, so it's just, it's kind of like a, uh, how to call it, I don't know what to call it, but it, it's, not a, it's not a fork, it's, 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 it's a, another distribution of Graal, just packaged on a, a more specific uh, use case. Uh, and in this case, it's native image for, for containers. Um, yeah, so that's, I'd, that's, I'd refer to it yeah. as a, ma a maintenance release. We use it for our, yeah. we will be using it for our supported releases. And it's also something that you can use uh, if you want to use it instead of the GraalVM download. But it, it's it's a slightly different build. Um, yeah. The, the one thing that Max didn't mention, we, we build it using the vanilla JDK 11U release as the build JVM to produce the Mandel release. Oracle have their own uh, JDK 11. They've made a few small enhancements, particularly to the way that the compiler plugs into OpenJDK. They've added a few extra things. Some of it's cosmetic, a little bit is performance. We wanted to use the vanilla JDK because that's the one we maintain and we're familiar with. So we didn't want to get into the territory of having to understand Oracle's enhancements and then finding we've we're not we've not understood what we built with. So we're just using the tool that we know to build it as well. It shouldn't make any difference to the functionality of the actual native image, and it'll probably make very tiny differences to the actual generation process, but yeah. nothing significant. But the same with the yeah. same with the changes that we make in the actual Mandrel code. We're not looking to add functionality that isn't upstream. We're trying to put everything upstream into the Graal community release if we can. We don't want to introduce differences. It's just 
suggests that for our own release management, we might need to do something slightly different to get it to build or to have something working that's a, a bug fix that's critical for us. So we've got our own maintenance uh, repo that we can use for our own support. So that's and other people can use as well. Uh, one question. So I think I suppose you like remerge regularly the the Graal VM upstream master with the Mandrel one. So that's yeah, to go from Graal VM to Mandrel. Yeah, we pull stuff down from upstream on a regular basis. But obviously, when we have a release, we fork that release tree off, and we will patch that release tree while we'll also be keeping the upstream thing up to date. So we'll be pulling patches down from upstream. We'll be uh, we'll be adding patches to upstream, and then we'll apply them to our own release trees. So we've got ah, so our own independent release for, management. Let's say the debug symbol. So you did a PR. It was apply upstream, and then you backported it to Mandrel. Is that That's what you well, well, it was actually put in just before Mandrel was first created, but we've had a few tweaks since then, and they've been um, pulled down into Mandrel. Because they're not part of a Graal release, we've actually cherry-picked them into our release to make sure the debug stuff works in the first Mandrel release, but the, the fixes are already upstream, and they will be in the next Oracle Graal release, Graal VM release, and they'll be in our Mandrel release. So w w there's occasions where we might cherry pick a fix and bring it in early to make sure it's there. But we're really not looking to add anything that isn't upstream. I mean, it's always upstream first. This is what Red Hat does with everything. And Graal is just like every other code base we contribute to. Upstream first and a maintenance release that we man maintain. Yeah, and no, that's the, the thing is just uh, for people to understand is this is... Uh, Oh, well, I'll say a year ago, or oh, a year ago, what, 10 months ago, when we had we had a big was meeting in community, this uh, Graalvm community meetup in, in, in Zurich, there's a lot of this, like, what is Red Hat doing? What is Graal doing? Uh, what is Oracle doing? What is the different team doing? Um, and, uh, yeah, this, this is no different than what we've done with, yeah, OpenDK or any other product. Um, it's just in this case, we uh, actually did it in collaboration with the Graalvm team. Um, so uh, that's the, the main difference here. Quick question, Andrew. Did, don't you have like a, a Graal VM native image server running? And if it's screwed up, then you just inherit that. So, you know, I know in Quarkus we do the no server because that wasn't really super stable. Um, sorry, I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> uh, the, the reason why your, your compilation is like hang, hanging, I wonder if it's because there is a server, like a Graal VM server stuck. Um, I don't think so. This is running as a self-contained program, so it's supposed to just spawn a JVM to run the native image generator and build this. So I'm not really quite sure why it's got stuck. Okay. Oh, it, because they it's know taking, Yep. It's oh, it's got it's to stage walking. three after 268 seconds, which is <laughs> I mean it, it took about about uh, 15 seconds to get to that point on previous runs. So I don't know what's mm -hmm. gone wrong. Something is something's. I don't know whether it's the machine or something's gone odd in, in the build, um, because you know, it, it, as I say, it was about ninety seconds for a normal build, about a hundred seconds to build um, the debug version. So I'm not really sure what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know. work in progress. Yeah. I, oh, oh, there we go. Look at that. There it's we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now it's actually building the image. There you go. Yeah. By the way, what well, is the uh, gigabyte number? Is that like, it's not what's that's, on disk, right? That's the amount of memory that the native image process, the generator has had okay. to allocate to keep track of all the code base. It's currently just, it's analyzed the universe. It's worked out all the classes, all the methods are needing. It's now parsing all those methods and in doing inlining, and then it's going to generate machine code for every method and build it into an image. So the compile stage and the actual image build are the last two stages, and we've almost got to them. So this this is this is how much how much memory it has to use to keep track of the the the, the, the actual program. You might you wonder why because this is like four classes. There's hello and three auxiliary classes, but there are actually many many substrate classes and many JDK runtime classes you need to build into the image. There we go. We've got it. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so I can actually um, I can actually run that. And we have a, a program. It's just a binary. And as I said, it's about 10 megabytes. I could actually run up GDB. Oh, I'll tell you also, I'll show you first um, just to show. There's now a local directory called sources, and it's got all the source files in. So this is what you can point the debugger at. 
um, when you want to debug and tell it, here's all the files. And the information in the binary will allow the debugger to show you the source lines as it runs. So there's the, the SRC directory has hello Java in. In the JDK directory, we've got Java base, Java. So, um, so Max is equivalent and so on. to IntelliJ asking to download the sources so I can see the source when I navigate my debug? Or Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's kind it's of the same sort of thing. I'll, I'll see if I can run up GDB. Um, oops. Yeah, again, as what, what I just put, for anyone who's watching, what Andrew is showing here is like the low level stuff that Quarkus and other tools would work on. Most of the stuff you won't actually have to touch. So here's, 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 here's GDB actually. Yeah, you, this, is a, this is not something that anybody who isn't a bit of an expert in, in Graal would, would want to use because you debug your application on, on OpenJDK. But if something goes wrong when you deploy it and it, it behaves differently, how do you know what's happening? You need to debug the native code. And that's what we've got here. If I just, um, I'll show you some, uh, what it, no, let's, this is info function main. I'm just saying, what functions do you know about called main? So it knows there's a function called hello main, and it sits in file hello Java. It knows there's a there's a function a method called Java math big integer divide and remainder, and that's in Java base Java math big integer. Now remember that's that those paths match all the directories that I uh, that's been that's it's stashed all the source files in. So if I tell GDB to use those directories as its source routes, this is like the way you would configure your IDE. Um, You made a typo. Source. Yeah. So, so these are the three directories relative to where we are now where the sources are found. I tell GDB that's where the sources are. Now we can break the main routine. And look, it knows that's the code address for where hello main is. It's in file hello Java, and it knows it's at line 41. So if we run up to that breakpoint, there we are. It's brought up in, in Emacs. It brings up the window. Here's the little cursor. We're at the first line of main, and it's line 42, actually. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Why is it 42? Um, anyway, so it knows it's here at this line of the file. And um, for example, it's we... at 42. I think that's why. Oh, okay. Yeah, 42 is a very important number. If we step, we should step into the builder method. There we go. We've moved to line seven. It tells us we're now in the frame for build. If we do a backtrace, we can see we're actually in hello greeter build, the builder method. That's being called from hello main. We're a slightly fewer few bytes into hello. Remember, it was 5500 was the entry point. And that's being called from this entry method, which is the thread entry method with a god awful name. Um, if we step again, um, we're about to uh, create a new object. This is interesting because when we create the new object, we switched into uh, Graal VM code. We're actually still in the backtrace. If you look, we're still in Hello Greeter, but we're now in the file called object header import because we're about to create a tag word to put into some memory that we're going to allocate to create a new object. If we keep stepping, we're stepping through the new operation and we're seeing what the substrate virtual machine is doing. It's We're in a routine called allocation snippets. It's got the local thread bu allocation buffer. It's found the top of the buffer. It's adding the size. Have we gone off the end? No, we can use that memory for this object. It'll write the header word in. Um, it's updating the 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 the, uh, the, the pointer. We're now going to write the uh, the actual header word of the of the object, and then we'll fill in all the fields in this for loop, zero them all, and then we come back out. We've now got that pointer into the block of memory that was locally allocated. That's the new object. So if we step out of this. There we are, we've built our greeter. If we step into the greet method, it'll do a virtual dispatch and it comes into default greeter greet. So we're actually stepping through the application code, the substrate code. We can even step into print LN, the, the system routine there. We're now going to do the synchronization operation. So, uh, and, Andrew, print. Andrew, just because we, we, we're running out of time here. So I just want to, so you, you've shown this debug just to, to try and uh, kind of explain how this will actually work for end users once this is more, it's called productized or integrated. Uh, it's not just for people. This is not the normal Java debug protocol, right? And this is no, the, this no, is this, this is 
you would leave it as a native app and literally just it looks up to Java stores rather than normal C kind of thing. Right? That's right. It's basically what you would get when you're debugging a C application. And I put information into the program that's the same sort of information that you would have for a C program that says the C source file is this, it's line, whatever. This is how you work out what the stack looks like. I've not yet put information about the types. It doesn't know about object layouts, but it knows about the code layouts and stack frames and and source files and source lines. And we'll put in information about types as well, so you'll be able to take a point to an object and print it and see it field by field. So, so yeah, you, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of what you do if you're debugging a C program. Yeah. So this, do do you know any debuggers? I don't, we talked about this like on and off the last few months, but the. Because the thing is, so you're not using your own debug, you're using DDB, but is there actually any IDEs today except the Emacs that works nicely with DDB and um, Java at the same time? There are, there are, there are, there have been several different debuggers that give you a GUI interface over. Yeah, there's, there was a thing called DBX tool on the old Sun machines. There's a, there's a, a, a another X Windows based debugger. There are graphical debuggers that will do the same sort of thing. Um, yeah. Uh, as you would have with a with a with a, a Java IDE, um, in some ways they're 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 they're, they're just a, they're very similar. There's a few things that aren't quite as slick. They don't have quite as good language integration, but they definitely work. Um, yeah. And and because this is just standard debug info that you would see in a in a C program, a debugger that knows how to read this stuff to debug C would be able to debug this Java yes, code because I've I've pirated the same layouts for the debug info as as a used for C code. Pirated. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, GDB doesn't know about Java anymore. <laughs> well, GDB only really knows about C. It doesn't know about Java. It used to years ago for GCJ, but not anymore. So I've had to yeah. basically make it look like a C program. We got some uh, rundown questions, so I'll, I'll just pick up two. Uh, yeah, man, I just, just before you do, I, I just want to say that the, 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 the idea is that, for example, VS Code has a DDB debugger, and Eclipse has the same too, and Intelia do too, at least in, in some of their variations. Yeah. Why did you just say so instead of like going the wrong road? Yeah, but, but <laughs> I was code, hoping Andrew. <laughs> for VS Code, we're actually going to generate the debug information that VS Code expects. Okay. So, so if you're debugging for Windows, we'll have Windows format information in the binary. So you'll yeah. be able to debug it as though it was a Windows um, program. It'll okay, think cool. it's a Windows C program, but it, it, you know it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Uh, so Dmitry is asking, will Android break the Struffle support? I might have missed it. So I think, yes, at the moment, we don't bring the Truffle support in Mandrel. Is it correct? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not absolutely certain of the where the latest decision is, but we, we have been building Mandrel with, I know we certainly have built Mandrel with just support for the native image and the components you need, the, the compiler and so on, to make native image work. We haven't built a Mandrel release, as far as I know, that has all the Truffle capabilities also in in the, the, the release, because that hasn't been something we'd be looking at. If you want to do that, you can use the GraalVM downloads. But we may put that in. I don't know whether that's been decided or not, so I, I can't say definitively. It is possible to build those things out, and it's not really a great interest of ours Initiate at the moment for supporting that. If you want to run Truffle yeah. with Quarkus, use the GraalVM download. They should both work. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. The reason for having Mandrel is so we can do support, not to, to give you all the functionality or to remove functionality. It's really so we know yeah. what we're working with. When you choose the source directory in the debugger, do you choose the directory with the .java files? I think the answer is yes. Um, yeah, well, all the sources that you need should have been found at build time. Okay. Because they'll be and looked up in the over. source jars and copied into a local cache. That sources directory that that was created as okay. part of running that build. So then you can put that on your on your deployment machine and tell the debugger where it is, and it will find all the Java files that okay. it needs to be able to debug. And I think the final question is: Do you have a release date for Mandrel? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't tell you that. Max might be able to. <laughs> We'd have Soon. to you. <laughs> Soon. Well, uh, so so let's let's say this. So, so the in the community we are working hard on actually getting a build out so there'll be something. If, you, if you're asking for a Windows release date that is supportive of Red Hat, that, that we can't answer, uh, except that it's on its way. But uh, yeah. yeah, so we're I trying mean, to get a build out. Fairly soon, like, you know, we can yeah. say about like this year is the reasonable expectation, for sure. Yes. Uh, uh, was that the last one? Uh, there was one around... Well, there was one around the closed world optimization and the time it takes. So would it be possible to 
analyze just the app part of the code and use uh, standard libs and link them? Well, the, the problem there is that you would be getting, you'd have to compile in all of the substrate capability and all of the JDK runtime just in case you needed it. Um, whereas if you analyze through from the app main class downwards, you can link in just the bits of the JDK runtime you want, just the substrate functionality that actually needs to be used. Um, because you may not use all the JDK APIs that call into the JVM, you can actually get rid of some of the substrate code. So it depends how big and fat an app you wanted. Um, having the whole of the JDK runtime, every JDK class compiled in, and every possible invocation, every method um, able to be resolved, would give you a very fat application because the JDK runtime is enormous. So oh, it's yeah, probably not a good idea. You might have maybe say have a halfway house and have all of Java base, but is, even that's quite big. I think it's an okay idea if you're really about startup time. That's probably a fair, fair one. But mm -hmm. if you are about memory density, just like Quarkus is, then that's less of a good idea for sure. Well, yeah. it'll, 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 it'll cut down your generate time. It's not going to help you with startup time because the more classes you compile in, the more static init you have to do at runtime because you can't initialize all of the JDK classes at compile time, at build time. So although you might take less time if you pre-analyzed, if you haven't cut all those classes out, your image is going to start up slower. One of the reasons it starts so quickly is it only runs initializers for the classes that it knows it needs. The, the finer the analysis, the less work you do to get your program running. So there's and a trade-off there. And I think that's the thing is, that it's also one of the things that, that I thought, I, in the beginning I saw a problem is just compiling this code or, or transforming it. But it's it's not just doing what's called normal compilation. It's also doing what in JavaScript world is called tree shaking, right? Like you're literally removing all the stuff that is there. And to it's actually dead code understand that. Yeah. So tree shaking is at yes. the source level and dead code elimination is at the Bytecode level, mm -hmm. right the bytecode level yeah. yeah but the, the the concept is the same right like you you have to have full world understanding for it to be effective and yes. it just takes time so yeah yeah I think the, more, was... the more finely you analyze the more stuff you can throw away and therefore the smaller and quicker your application startup is yes it's yeah. a virtuous cycle right so you don't, mm -hmm. don't want to buy too yeah. much in uh, quick and, somebody, and if you think about it, uh, go ahead. sorry, I was going to say a, a, a trade-off at build time of a, a, say another five minutes even for microsecond, you know, milliseconds, um, uh, getting rid of 10, 20 millisecond startup time. That's really worth it because you're going to start up your deployed application many, many times. You won't build anything like as often. Obviously, it's a bit of a pain for the developers, but you need to think about which is your priority here. You know. Yes. So is Mandrel a fork of Graal VM? So I'll, I'll just try it with my own world. Uh, it is what we call a downstream version. So we apply all of our work and the patches upstream, and then we reapply them to Mandrel, which is the downstream for which we have a better control of the life cycle, right? That, that's what it is. But essentially the same feature, the same code is, is all coming from uh, GraalVM slash whatever, whatever. Yeah, so look at it that as uh, Oracle has their Java DDK, they, they, they give away for free or some uh, sell off. And Mandrel uh, and, and Red Hat has an OpenDK. They have a RHEL or OpenDK community. Those are not forks, but they are different builds with slightly different alterations depending on who built it, what their priorities are. It's the same thing here. So technically, it's a fork, but it's not like a fork of oh, we're doing something different. So uh, definitely not our style. <laughs> So we're yeah. <laughs> less than 10 minutes over, which frankly is pretty good with uh, Brock and Demo <laughs> and Andrew and I and Max uh, all in the same yeah. call. So I call it a success. Uh, yes. If you have other questions, you know, come on uh, the, I don't know, the Zulip and we'll, you know, uh, get some of the Mandrel people are actually hanging out over there. So we can, you know, definitely continue the conversation there. Yeah. Anything we want to plug? Uh, oh yeah, just show, if you are interested in the, tiny greedy details is GraalVM slash Mandrel. So it's actually hosted in the same way GraalVM, the original code is hosted, right? So it's, uh, it's you know, good good uh, yeah. interaction with uh, both. And, and just to be clear, just, so, so the Mandrel stuff is developed under GraalVM. So the GraalVM mailing list and the GraalVM Slack is where the main Mandrel is. Uh, and I know that some Mandrel guys here will say, hey, we also over here in this other place. We're, like, we're moving all that stuff over there. Uh, to, to yeah, be Graal VM is Graal VM is a community that we are part of, and Oracle are part yeah. of, and a few yes. other companies are part of. But it's this is very much a community-based effort, which is great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, people. 
thank you for staying with us and uh, see you next week, I think, with Mutiny. Is yes. It? It uh, is. Like reactive, uh, how to do reactive applications. So definitely the much higher level stacks than Andrew has been going on because I don't think there is a notion of a reactive. Trawling through the bits and bytes in the gutter, right? Yeah, yeah as ever. <laughs> all right. Goodbye, everyone, and so, see you next week. And please don't you. forget I to subscribe, vote up, you know, and all of that to, uh, you know, crack up the volume on the Quarkus Insights. Yes. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.